First of all, thank you very much to the Embassy and to the National Gallery for everything that's happening around Soroya at the moment. Soroya in the art market, from a means of success to oblivion and back. <laughs> if one looks at the complete history of the art world, the immensely successful career of Soroya straddled the two centuries that appear to me to have seen the greatest changes to how the art market has operated. Prior to the 19th century, artists were thought of more as artisans. The masters would accept commissions from their patrons, usually royal to the aristocracy in the church. They then had to execute the works with or without the assistance of their workshops in accordance with the terms of agreed the greed relating to price and studio participation and the wishes and choice of subjects stipulated by the patron. Following the French Revolution in the first half of the 19th century, nearly all the royal collections in Europe were given to their respective nations to form the basis of their national collections and museums, such as the Louvre in Paris and the Prado in Madrid. From then on, artists started creating their own non-commissioned work in the hope of receiving recognition from the artistic establishment of the moment, as determined by each country's National Academy, Academy of Fine Arts. Soroya was therefore born into the world of academies, salons, and national exhibitions. He came from humble origins, and I think, and this I think contributed to his desire to succeed on the back of his great natural talent. Soraya's career can, I think, be divided into three phases. First, the salon artist period. Second, the international individual activities. <coughs> Third, the commission for the vision of Spain. The first two were highly successful. The third, I think, not so much. The first phase was based on large paintings of historical and social subjects as required by the Salons and Academy. In 1884, the Prado del Pallete won Soraya's scholarship <coughs> from the Diputación de Valencia to study at the Spanish Academy in Rome. From 1885 to 1889, he lived in Rome and studied at Spain's finest academy. After completing his studies, he went on to win many prizes at the national exhibitions and salons in Madrid, Paris, Munich, Vienna, Venice, and Chicago. In 1895, he won the first gold medal with return from fishing at the Salon des Artistes Francais. It was acquired by the French government from the Musée du Luxembourg and is now in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. In 1897, sold a, selling the sale, won a gold medal at the Internationale Kunstausstellung in Munich, and in 1900 it formed part of a group of paintings that won in the Grand Prix at the Exposition Universelle in Paris. In 1905, he presented it at the 6th Venice Biennale where it was required for the Capri Salon Museum for 10,000 francs. In 1900, said inheritance was the most commented on of the groups of works that won him the Grand Prix at the Exposition Universelle in Paris, the greatest salon exhibition of all time, the Salon to End All Salons. By now he had fulfilled his, his ambitions as a salon artist. In the second phase, he decided to go his own way. Through his apuntes or sketches, he developed his way of painting to achieve light. And I think light was sort of the holy grail for nearly all artists at the end of the 19th century, both those inspired by Velázquez and the Impressionists. In this juncture, I think it's also important to note that there has always been a discussion around the definition of the term Impressionism, which has turned out to be crucial in the context of art world marketing, especially in relation to French Impressionism. 
The term was originally coined by the critic and humorist Louis Leroy, who wrote a scathing review of the first exhibition of the Saint Andrés Pondo in 1884 in the newspaper Le Charlie Roy. Within it, he made a play on words with the title of Claude Monet's Impression Soleil Levant, and he gave the artists the name by which they became known, derisively titling his article The Exhibition of the Impressionists. Leroy declared that Monet's painting was at most a sketch and could hardly be termed a finished work. In my, in my mind, it's clear that in the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century, with the advent of plein air painting, the expression of nature and life became the name of the game. The question was how to achieve it. Some artists, such as Manet, Sargent, Soroya, and Zorn, looked to Velázquez for guidance, as he was able to show them how to achieve the effect of light through freedom of brushwork whilst retaining the form and weight of their subject matter in particular figures. Hence, Velázquez is seen by some historians as the father of Impressionism, whilst others maintain that it is the disintegration of form in order to create light as practiced by Monet, Pissarro, Sisley, and others, which was then further developed by the Pointeists, Seurat, and Signac, it is the essence of Impressionism. In an interview with Rodolfo Hill in 1913, Soroya said, Now firm on my base, I began to create for myself without any fear, doing things my way, good or bad. I don't know the true, sincere, real, a reflection of what my eyes see and what my heart feels exactly the manifestation of what I think art should be. This did not happen suddenly, and finally I achieved it, resolved, and in all its fullness in the oxen beach in the boat of my afternoon sun from 1903. Now is when my hand completely obeys my retina and my feelings. He was now ready to enter the 20th century art market the world of commercial galleries, dealers, critics, and one-man shows. Following on from the Salon des Indépendants, by the 1890s, both Paul Durand Ruel and Ambroise Bollard had opened their galleries. They exhibit art exhibited artists, such as Monet, Pissarro, Cézanne, and Gauguin, and in 1901, Bollard was already exhibiting Picasso. Works like this, <coughs> together with his portraits, were to be the core of his one-man shows. The first was at the Georges Petit Gallery in Paris in 1906. Clearly, he was well aware of how the new art market was working and of Paris's position in it. It was received to great critical acclaim. Camille Maudet, chief historian and ecologist of the French Impressionists, wrote, Artists of France, I beg you to visit this exhibition where you will learn all the lessons of plein air, line, color, impasto, and originality. Also in 1906, Henri Rochefort wrote, never has a brush contained so much sunlight. This is not impressionism. It is incredibly impressive. <laughs> he then went on to exhibit in Berlin in 1907, and at the Grafton Galleries in 1908, which we've already heard something about. And here Soroya met Archer Milton Huntington, who founded the Hispanic Society of America. Huntington invited Soroya to hold the first exhibition to be organized by the Hispanic Society. The exhibition opened on the 7th of February, 1909, and was visited by 170,000 people in a month the largest number ever to attend an exhibition in New York City. Here, he also received great critical acclaim. James Gibbon, Hunnic, Gibbons Hunnicker in his book, Promenade of an Impressionist Great. By reason of his native genius and stubborn willpower, he became what he is, the painter of vibrating sunshine without equal. Let there be no mincing of comparisons in this assertion not Turner, not Monet, 
painted so directly blinding troughs of sunlight as has this Spaniard. After New York, the exhibition traveled to Buffalo and Boston, but it was also a selling exhibition. And fortuitously for Soroya, the timing was perfect. In 1909, the art market in New York was starting to flourish. America was about to come onto the international art scene in a big way. A number of major European dealers and gallery owners had recently established themselves there, most notably Joseph Green. So the time of Soroy's first exhibition in America, from a commercial point of view, was perfect. Well, this was, although this was probably more by chance than intent. Prior to 1909, American collectors importing works of art to the United States were subject to a massive 187.5% import duty. As reported in the following editorial mm -hmm. published, in the Boston Globe in 1908. When the duties of $150,000 on the old masters valued at $80,000 mm -hmm. have been paid, it may perhaps dawn on Mrs. J. L. Gardner how grievously she has offended against this great and glorious republic in trying to import works of art. <laughs> the law of this republic is very strict with all misguided persons who dare to bring to this land paintings or statutory or valuable works of research. What these persons should do if they wish to be favorably regarded by the law is import dogs. <laughs> <laughs> a snarling, rare-eyed bulldog of uncertain walk and disagreeable temper valued at $10,000 can be imported for your duty. <laughs> An obese, ungainly and repulsive tax under the value of $5,000 can also be imported for your duty. It is expected that all good and wealthy citizens will spend their money decorating the land of the free with high art of this variety. And if their dogs are paid to breed, no duties will be charged. But any millionaire who tries to import works by Titian, Rubens, or Turner is lucky if he escapes jail, all of which proves us to be a logical, reasonable, and highly intelligent nation. <laughs> The removal of these duties in 1908 started the ball rolling that was to change the whole structure of the art market over the course of the 20th century. In total, 195 works were sold and Soraya went home with $181,760, a massive amount of money in his pocket. This was a major tipping point in his career. This allowed him to build his new house and studio in Madrid, now the Soroya Museum. And by now, he had a relationship with the Spanish royal family. In 1907, that's the, in 1907, he had painted this plan air portrait of King Alfonso XIII. From 1910, he and his family spent the summers in San Sebastian and Beirut when he turned to the more relevant side of society for his subjects. In 1911, he exhibited at the Art Institute of Chicago and the City Art Museum of St. Louis under the auspices of the Hispanic Society. In Chicago, the exhibition received more than 100,000 visitors in a month and sales exceeded another $80,000. At this time, he also became the most sought-after portrait painter in America, painting amongst others President Taft and Louis Comfort Tiffany, which enabled him to show that he could also capture the special light of Long Island Sound, as well as that of all the different regions of Spain. Mm -hmm. Thus, phase two ended on a big high. The third phase starts when Huntington decided to commission Vision of Spain a mural 70 liter, meters long and three and a half meters high to be the centerpiece of the Hispanic Society of America and offered him $150,000. Initially, he was reluctant and daunted by the size of the task, but eventually he succumbed to the temptation of the fee and his feelings of loyalty to his great patron 
who had made it possible for him to live the American dream without having to move to America. It took him seven years to complete Baldwin's painting on location. In the summer of 1916, he took his only respite and returned to his native Valencia, where he produced some of his best paintings of his whole career. He finished the last panel of Vision of Spain, the Tuna Gap Giamonte, on the 29th of June, 1919. Within a year, on the 17th of June, 1920, he had a major stroke whilst painting in his garden. It left him paralyzed and unable to paint. He was 57. The Vision of Spain was installed posthumously in the Hispanic Society of America and opened to the public in 1926. By then, the driving forces behind the art market were perceived desirability and that it was a freely movable asset. In the 1920s, the avant-garde movements in modern art had already taken center stage. Quantyism, Fauvism, Cubism, Expressionism, Surrealism had all happened. And so Soroy's vision of Spain was already seen as passé by the time it was opened. He got left behind, as by the way did the Impressionists as well. Then the stock market crashed in 1929. We then had the Great Depression of the early 30s, and the market hit rock bottom. It did not recover for 25 to 30 years until well after the Second World War. My Wife and Daughters in the Garden was acquired for $8,000 by Thomas Fortune Ryan in Soroy's 1911 Chicago exhibition. Ryan was Soroy's second most important patron in America. And following his death in 1928, the Anderson Galleries in New York held the auction of his collection, which included 20 Soroyas. Ten of the Soroyas were acquired by J. Paul Getty. Amongst them, this one, my wife and daughters in the garden. Getty paid $600 for it less than one thirteenth of the price of the price paid by Ryan in nineteen eleven. <coughs> by nineteen sixty eight it was in the Fernando Rivieri collection in Barcelona, and in nineteen ninety three it was acquired privately for a new world record price at the time for Soroya by the Massadeo collection in Oviedo. Curiously, prior to these Soroya paintings, Mr. Getty had only ever acquired one painting in 1931. Several of the stories he did buy are still in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. By the 1950s, the market for the French Impressionists was beginning to recover, aided, I think, by André Malraux's marketing effort to make French the ultimate brand in the world for culture, elegance, sophistication, and desirability as well as the international Jewish community's French culture base. By then, in 1957, but then in 1957, <coughs> France introduced a 7% sales tax on art, and Paris immediately lost its position as the world's capital of the art market for London. In 1958, the brilliant young Peter Wilson had just become chairman of some of this. He organized the sale in London of seven superb French Impressionist paintings belonging to the American collector <coughs> Jacob Goldschmidt. This sale was to change the art market forever. In one night at Sotheby's first ever evening sale, the price of French Impressionists multiplied by 10. Impressionist paintings over to gold masters as the driving force behind the art market. And an art auction made the front pages of all the major newspapers and the television news for the first time ever. It was this one night of madness, fueled by the undreamt wealth of wealth acquired suddenly by Greek ship owners like Neonikos Boulandris and Mbibikos 
due to the serious crisis, or was it the beginning of a new era for the international art market? It turned out to be the latter. This, however, did not benefit Soroya at all at this time. He was not French, and Spain was isolated under Franco's rule. But it did cause my father to change the direction of his gallery, as from 1959, he decided to specialize in Spanish art, as he could no longer afford to deal in French art. <laughs> Soroya's resurgence started in Spain, following on from the major exhibition held in Madrid to celebrate the centenary of his birth in 1963. My first involvement with Soroya was when my father organized a small Soroya exhibition at his Broadway art gallery in 1964. It was not a great success. He only managed to sell four paintings. Amongst them, this sketch for Tristia Renthia for 500 pounds. It was resold by the descendants of the doctor who, from Bromsgrove, who bought it in 1964 for 182,500 pounds at Sullivan's in December 2014. At the time, in 1964, my father was always infuriated when potential clients rang Sotheby's to inquire after Soroya and were told that they'd never heard of him. <laughs> in the early 80s, when I mentioned this to Peter Wilson, he said, Edmund, of course your father was right about Soroya, but you must always remember that in the art world, being right at the wrong time equals being wrong. <laughs> in the late 60s, Spain enjoyed its first economic boom since the Civil War. This incited Spanish buyers to resuscitate the Soraya market. They continued to be the driving force behind the market in the 70s and the 80s. It should also be noted that this coincided with a moment when most of the Soroyas bought by Americans in his 1909 and 1911 exhibitions had been left to or donated to American museums who had relegated them to storage and were willing to the acquisition. This painting was bought by Henry Archer, Henry Huntington, Archer's cousin in 1909 for $5,000, and was later acquired by a Spanish collection in the 1960s, and then by Pedro Macedonia. Return from fishing was donated to the Pasadena Museum of Art in California by Mrs. Jarvis W. Barlow and was then deacquisitioned by the museum in 1969. It was then acquired by Francisco Rodio of Barcelona and ready to resold by his daughter at Sullivan's to an international buyer for $3,650,000 in 2014. In 1989, I curated the exhibition the painter Joaquin Soroya. It opened at the IBM galleries in New York, then went to the City Art Museum in St. Louis, and then the San Diego Museum of Art, before finally coming to Valencia as the opening exhibition at Ivan, Valencia's new museum of modern art. It retraced Soroya's American exhibitions, the South America 1909, St. Louis 1911. San Diego 1926, when it was the San Diego Museum's opening exhibition and Soroya's first posthumous exhibition, and then came to Valencia, his birthplace. My objectives were to try to widen the scope of appreciation. Apuntes, the sketches, landscapes, gardens, etc., and show works from American collections which had never been seen in Spain before. So I think I had some success as we saw my wife and daughters in the garden was sold privately for a new world record price in 1993. And in 2013, this painting, Maria de Valenciana, was acquired privately by an American collector for a top price. In 2012, Valencian Fisherman was acquired by a Belgian collection for $5,950,000. This painting was originally acquired <coughs> by the German government for 5,000 Deutschmarks in 1896, 
for the National Museum in Berlin. How it got into the hands of French dealer Edouard Jonah in the 1920s is uncertain. <laughs> he then sold it to the Infante Don Alfonso de Bourbon, and later it was acquired by Dr. Alfonso Ferrer of Valencia, whose descendants consigned it to auction in 2012. Despite these successes, the world record price at auction of $6,274,000 still lies with Bath Time, which was acquired by Spanish Lady in 2003. Sadly, this work was commissioned by a South American collector who specified exactly what he wanted, and Soroya just executed it in the studio to get the money. And it is, in my view, the antithesis of a good Soroya. <laughs> In 2009, the Prado organized the greatest retrospective exhibition of Soraya's work ever held. It threw insight into all aspects of his work, perhaps the most outstanding being his ability to sun, uh, paint sunlight, as this picture from the Prado's own collection shows. 459,267 visitors saw this exhibition one of the greatest attendance levels achieved by any exhibition ever, ever held at Spain's National Museum. Since then, Soroya has had major exhibitions in Dallas at the Meadows Museum in 2014, Munich and Giovanni in 2016, and now in London at the National Gallery and next at Dublin. The media, publishers, and filmmakers have also contributed to his recognition and success. His international presence and popularity are growing, and his market is still strong for high quality works. However, currently, supply is very short, partially due to the restrictions of heritage legislation, and this may end up uh, turning out to be slightly damaging. Thank you.